Let us open the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 21, verses 1 to 11. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 21, verses 1 to 11, that are often called the triumphal entry of Jesus Christ. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, this is the prophet, Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. Now let us pray and ask God for his blessing. Father, we thank you so much for your word that you have given to us, written through human instruments, but yet under inspiration of your Holy Spirit. We do ask, Lord, that the Holy Spirit will speak to us, will open this passage and will make us not only understand it, but also apply it to our own lives. We do ask for change of heart that only you can produce, for the changing of the heart of stone that often is inside of us to make it the heart of flesh. So we ask, Father, that this word may be a blessing to many, but above all, that it may be used for the glory of your name. In Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Now we are going to look at this passage from Scripture from Matthew 21, and I titled it, a king unlike any other. A king unlike any other. Now, people like to make their entrances big in this world. Their entrances to mean something about them, to display something of their glory. Now, not a long time ago, we had a big event in Great Britain uh, during the coronation of King Charles himself. Actually, the event was the coronation. What greater event in this land for quite a while. Now, it wouldn't... When you scroll through the pictures and through... And if you remember maybe the videos of what was going on, you may remember the splendor of the articles, the coronation, and how much work must have gone into the preparation of it. I mean... When you look at the quality of the royal robes that were sewn, when you look at the royal crown, when you look at the items that were being used, when you look at the at the chariot that that's being that that's well was prepared for this very purpose, how amazingly wealthy and beautiful it looked, what kind of a horses were uh, were carrying it. Even looking at the servants <laughs> that, that were driving on, this, on, on it, friends, it was a display of immense wealth. Furthermore, a great retinue of people were surrounding King Charles, not just his family, but thinking about the famous and great politicians, thinking about the army that would follow generals and spiritual leadership. Everything was made so that the importance and greatness of the person will be portrayed. So King Charles must be shown and represented the way how he is, in full splendor and majesty of the royalty that he is and the throne that he is taking. This is the way of the world, and people mimic that everywhere. Think about the entrances at the red, red carpet by the 
at the Oscars or any of the music awards. People dress up in the way to make a lasting impression on others. They will either display something of the amazing wealth that they've got. I mean, some of the things quite ridiculous, but there we go. But often people will dress up in order to shock the audience in one way or another. But this is typical of us today. People do that. They dress up in certain ways to and making an entrance in such a way to make a statement about how important and wealthy they are and that they are above everybody else. That's really what's at the bottom of it. And uh, But not so much with Jesus Christ in this passage. When you look at his person of who he is, Jesus is the creator of the universe. Can you get any higher than that? Jesus is the promised Messiah, the promised King who was meant to come for thousands of years, predicted through the prophetic writings of Scripture of the Old Testament, showing to us who he's going to be, what he's going to do. And finally, he has arrived to his city, Jerusalem, and he's riding on a donkey surrounded by common people, welcomed by common people, not wearing any robes of royalty, not driving on any stallion or an exotic beast like the elephants in those days that rulers used to do. He came in humble appearance. The promised king who would have every reason to be full of himself and to make an entrance in a splendorous and majestic way, chose rather to do it in a very simple servant-like manner. Now, this is quite a statement that, that we want to ponder about today. You see, Jesus was not the kind of a king and savior that people expected. His objective was not to sit on the throne of Jerusalem literal Jerusalem in this world, his objective, at least at the time, was not to rule the earth as one of the political and military leaders. His objection was written in Matthew 20, verse 18. This is what Jesus was all about. He says, see, we are going up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and scribes and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified, and he will be raised on the third day. You see, the Lord did not come to rule over people, at least not in his first coming. He came as a servant king to give himself, to give his life as a ransom for many. He didn't, come to, he didn't co come to conquer Rome and the power of Rome. He came to conquer sin and death and to bring salvation to all those who believe in him, making everlasting peace between God and us through the cross, through his own blood, through his own life. So the Lord refused the temptation to seize earthly power fame and wealth, things that people desire the most. Because he made himself of no reputation, he made himself servant, as Philippians chapter 2 tells us, even unto death, even death on a cross for us. So friends, with this in mind, we are going to look at this passage of the triumphal, triumphal entry of the Lord through those three points. The first one will be the humble entry, the humble entry. Secondly, the prophetic entry. And thirdly, the greater entry, all coronation. We'll see that in a few moments. But keep this in mind that Jesus Christ is a king, and yet he is unlike any other. Verses 1 to six tells us, now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, 
Then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. And now jumping to verse 6, the disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. A little bit of a background to the story. Why is this happening? Why is Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem even of any importance at all? Why should we consider it? Why should we bother? We're living in the United Kingdom. Why Jerusalem? What's important about Jerusalem? Isn't that one of the hundreds, if even not thousands of the cities in the world? Why is Jerusalem of any importance? Well, open Psalm 48 and let us read verses 1 and 2. Psalm 48, verses 1 and 2. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, his holy mountain. Beautiful in elevation is the joy of all the earth, Mount Zion, in the far north, the city of the great king. You see, Jerusalem, from the very early days of the nation of Israel, was the chosen city in which God chose to build his name. Of course, chose, God chose to dwell in a very particular manner in this place uh, from all the places in the world. Although God is, oh, God is omnipresent, he is everywhere, yet he chose to make his special presence in Jerusalem. First of all, because Jerusalem is a city of King David, to whom God gave the promise that from his line, God will bring the Messiah. And lo and behold, Jesus of Nazareth appears on the scene from both sides, from both Mary and Joseph, having the title and a right as a king. Now, of course, I'm not telling that Joseph was a physical father of Jesus yet, Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit, but through Joseph, as being one of his sons, he received the right to reign as a king over Israel. Now, Jerusalem was a chosen city by God because God put a very special building inside of it. Do you know what this building was? His temple. He established a priesthood in which sacrifices were to be offered to his name, covering for the sins of the people, also illustrating the coming of the greatest high priest who will offer his sacrifice once and for all of himself, and that is Jesus Christ. So that Jerusalem, from the prophetic importance, cannot be, cannot be overstated. He was the city in which God choose to use as his revelation to this world. So, in those days, crowds followed in the city. We read about the crowds, and uh, we know from historical records that in those days, the crowd could be as high as, are you ready for it, even over two million people. We know this because 20 years after those events, the census was preserved for us from the temple that told us how many lambs were sacrificed on the Passover. There were about 260,000 lambs sacrificed and eaten. And we know that a lamb ought to be shared by about 10 people. So... Calculating that, you get a number of well over 2 million people. This is still lowballing it quite a lot, but you are getting an idea that Jerusalem at the time of the Passover was swollen by the crowds of pilgrims, of Jewish people from all around the world, people who were, who were in diaspora, sent into all the corners of Roman Empire, Persia, Media, and other Eastern nations, a lot, Egypt, and so on. They were coming to eat the Passover, the remembrance of how the Lord rescued them from the power of Egypt. 
Jesus chose the Passover because he is the Passover lamb. He's the Passover lamb. Like John the Baptist says, Behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. All of those Old Testament illustrations were shadows. They were pointing to who Christ is and what he's going to do. So imagine this city of Jerusalem being swarmed by people, preparing themselves for this religious celebration of God who rescued them from a slavery to Egypt and makes them a nation of his own. And here comes Jesus of Nazareth. We know that he was welcomed by the crowds in an incredibly enthusiastic way because he fulfilled their expectation for the Messiah for whom they were waiting for. In John 12, verse 9, we read that when the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he raised from the dead. People heard about the miracle and they acknowledged Jesus that he must be the one chosen by God. Who else would do miracles like he does? And Lazarus was standing there as a testimony to who Jesus was. So the crowds were enthusiastic about him. Yet we read in John 12, 10. So the chief priest made plans to put Lazarus to death as well. Because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. Ha! You can see the picture of much clearer. The Pharisees, the religious and political leaders of Jerusalem and Judea, wanted him dead. He was to die. He was not the Savior they wanted. He was not the Christ they wanted. He actually had a lot of things to say about them, exposing them hypocrisies and a little mafia-like business, maybe not little, with the temple. Their own rule will come to an end if Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, were to reign. So they wanted to get rid of him. And yet God caused the crowds to cover him. Their enthusiasm, their crowds that followed Jesus made it unable for the Pharisees to seize him and to kill him. In one of the statements, actually in John's Gospel, they say, See, we can do nothing. The whole world went after him. So this is the atmosphere of our passage. There are those who want to kill Jesus with passion. There is Judas who is ready to betray him also. But there is also crowds and the rest of the apostles being excited about their Christ who has come as a conqueror king. Now, how did Jesus choose to enter the city? That's quite surprising, isn't it? Jesus chose to enter Jerusalem as this great promised king riding on a stallion, an elephant. No, riding on a donkey. And not even that. On a coat of a donkey. On a sm- <laughs> it's the amazing thing about the Lord. That he was making a statement to them. That he didn't come as political ruler. He came as a humble servant. Like in Matthew 20. We are being told that he didn't come to be served. But to serve and to give his life as a la- ransom for many. He didn't come to become king of Jerusalem. He came to die for his people. So the Lord chose this little cult to ride on it to make a statement of the kind of king he was. That's why we titled the sermon, A King Unlike Any Other. He didn't come to rule, he came to save. You see, But even when the Lord chose this donkey, the lowly animal of work, he made it in such a way as to strengthen the faith of the disciples. Notice uh, notice what he says uh, in our passage that the Lord sent the disciples to a certain location to find a donkey and its colt and to bring them to him. And if anybody asked what they do, they would just simply say, Lord, Lord needs it. He put these two disciples to the test. That was their obedience to be shown to trust what he's telling them. Notice that 
the Lord had those animals prepared and the Holy Spirit reserved it for him. In another passage, we're actually told by the owners of the animal that no one else rode on this colt before. It's like to say he was specifically prepared for the mission that was for it. Disciples did encounter the owners of the animals, of this of these animals, of the mother and the colt, and uh, as exactly as the Lord told them in, uh, in the Gospel of Mark and Luke, it is written that they asked them, "What are you doing?" Now think about it in this way: that would kind of look like stealing, isn't it? People are coming and taking somebody else's animals without asking any questions. How would you feel if I would just? If I would take the keys of your car without you noticing and just go and rode away with your car. You told me I'm stealing this car. Now, but the Lord put the disciples to the test because the owners were ready for it. Somehow through the Holy Spirit, they were reserving these animals for the use of God. Somehow they knew that this was their destination, what is to happen to them. Because as soon as these disciples said to the owners, the Lord needs them, they permitted them to go, to be used. Two points can be stated at this point. Notice the humble nature of the Lord. He came to serve. He is the servant king who came to give his life for us. But also notice the test that he was putting the disciples to, to trust his word, even though it may be hard and difficult, and to trust that, he, that God will provide all that is needed. They went by faith and they found exactly what the Lord told them will happen. They trusted the Lord and it was fulfilled to them. The same is with us. Whatever the Lord calls us to do, he will provide exactly what is needed at the right time. We are there to go and make disciples of all the nations. And the Lord will provide everything that is needed. And he has everything ready for us. Isn't that our story? Isn't that the story of God's provisions? Isn't that how the Lord chooses to supply us? How he chooses to test our faith in the times when we think we're lacking something. All of a sudden we receive that. Only in a way that we know it's from him. You see, the Lord wants us to exercise trust in him, to give ourselves wholly to his service, and he will honor that. So, friends, maybe a good question to ask about this thing is, if the Lord was seeking salvation of others, are you seeking the same what he seeks? Are you ready to step down from earthly pride and earthly pursuits to give yourself to the glory of the kingdom of God? Are you so preoccupied with your pride, with your titles, with your work, so that the kingdom of God lays somewhere at the back of the corner of your mind and maybe one day when you feel like it, you will serve him? I need to call you now to give yourself to the Lord's service today. Be of the heart of the Lord. Follow his example, because if he was not ashamed to carry your sins and your trespasses upon the cross of Calvary, you should not be ashamed or even question two times whether you should give yourself to his glory. That's our calling. That's our service to do the will of God the Father. Now, secondly, we see that this event was not only a humble event, a humble king, but also the prophetic event. Look at verses four and five. This took place, says Matthew, to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the fall of a beast of burden. Now, like many times before, Matthew tells us again that what has been happening was exactly what was prophesied in the Old Testament. Or in other words, it was divinely announced beforehand by God to take place. Do you know that Bible is the only book in the world that claims its authority from being able to perfectly and accurately predict the future? God boasts about it. God tells us that this is his word and we may know it because every promise, everything that he says comes to pass. 
If there is one promise, if there is one prophecy that we know didn't come to pass, that it didn't happen like the Lord told us it would happen, then we can shred the Bible and get rid of it. All of its authority lays on the fact that God can and is accurately predicting the future thousands and hundreds of years before it happens. There is no book like that. And uh, as Christians, we are often getting, I don't know how to put it, but we are diminishing the Bible by getting too familiar with this simple yet miraculous work of God. Friends, every promise fulfilled is a miracle from God that should make our hearts jump and our confidence in the Bible to be sky high. Look at what Isaiah 46 says, verse 9. God says, I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is not none like me. How is God different? How do we know that there is no one like God? Verse 10, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose. God gives us a challenge saying there is no one like him and you will know that there is no other book like it. There is no other God like him. Because God accurately predicts and declares the future. So you can know that the Bible is the word of God by studying prophetic writings. There is no other book like it. Matthew does it times and times again. Matthew, Mark and Luke and John quoting the Old Testament passages showing that those things were predicted thousands and hundreds of years before Christ even came to the scene. For example, God prophesied the coming of Jesus Christ as soon as Genesis 1, really. When you think about the statement that God separated light from darkness, and Jesus is called the light of God. And in John chapter 3, it says that people chose to dwell in darkness and rejected the light because they loved their sin. In Genesis chapter 3, God gave a declaration that from the offspring of a woman, a son will come who will crush the power of Satan and yet himself will be bruised. The one who will give his life and yet crush the power of the serpent, of Satan himself, of sin and death. See, my friends, the Bible told us where Christ will be born, Bethlehem, from which family he's going to come, the family of Adam, of Seth, the Abra- then from Noah, then from, she- then, then from Shem, then from Abraham, and then we go through, through um, Jacob, Isaac, Jacob, and Judah, and goes down to the David's line, and through David we eventually got the genealogy pointing to us that Christ appeared exactly as he was promised to King David and Abraham and those beforehand. We learn from Scripture beforehand who Jesus is going to be, what he's going to do. In Psalm 22, for example, we have the vivid illustration written by King David 1,000 years before Christ was born, what Christ felt on the cross of Calvary. It's like an insight into his soul of what he feels, the pain of of physical, emotional, and spiritual nature. In Psalm 2, the coming of the king is predicted. In In Isaiah 53, the reason for his suffering is given that the culmination of his ministry will be the cross, salvation of people, that he will give his life for us as a substitute making peace between us and God. Time will fail me to count the prophecies that has been fulfilled by the Lord Jesus Christ. But one of those prophecies is found in Zephaniah chapter 9, verse 9. It's part of it from which Matthew is quoting, but we'll read it in full. Zephaniah 9, verse 9. 
It says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the fall of a donkey. It's worth noting that this prophecy is hundreds of years old before Christ was born. And it describes with perfect accuracy what was going on in Jerusalem on the Palm Sunday when Jesus entered in. Notice what does Zephaniah tell us about where will the promised king arrive? Zion and Jerusalem. What is what his character is going to be like? The character of this king. He will be righteous and humble. Does that fit the Lord Jesus Christ? Perfectly. How will he enter Jerusalem? He will be riding on a donkey, on a colt, the fall of a donkey. Interesting. What will he bring? It says, having salvation is he. Salvation he will bring, rescue. How will Jerusalem react to his coming? He will be shouting aloud and rejoicing with great joy. It's amazing. The prophet was able to see through the, through the work of the Holy Spirit the day of Jesus' coming and predicting it with such perfect accuracies. We need to be confident about our Bibles. You see, friends, people were shouting these words. Hosanna to the son of David. Do you know what that word Hosanna means? It means from Hebrew, the best translation is save now. Save now. Exactly what Zephaniah 9, 9 tells us, he will bring salvation. And this is what people shouted. Son of David, that is pr the promised king of the line of David. Bring salvation to us. Come in the name of the Lord. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Or in other words, salvation from highest. From heaven. He was coming to do the will of God. To bring salvation to his people. And people rejoiced. They knew the promise has been, is being fulfilled. And they put their cloaks and even the palm branches underneath him. That was a symbol from the Old Testament to welcome the king, that the crowds approve of him. Yet it is worth noting that they did not understand what kind of a king and what kind of a mission Jesus really had. Because Jesus told to Pilate, Pontius Pilate, Roman governor, that his kingdom is not of this world and that he indeed is king. But he didn't come to conquer Rome. He didn't come to sit on the throne in Jerusalem. You see, John MacArthur wrote about the reaction of people. He says that the people wanted a conquering, reigning Messiah who would come in great military power to throw off the brutal yoke of Rome and establish a kingdom of justice and righteousness where God's chosen people have a special favor. But Jesus did not come to conquer Rome but to conquer sin and death. He did not come to make war with Rome, but to make peace with God for men. He did not come to make war with Rome, but to make peace with God for men. As it is written in Colossians 1.19, it says, For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. In other words, Jesus is God. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. The crowds wanted the king who will bring prosperity, who will fulfill their dreams in this life, who will cast away the yoke of Rome, who will bring peace upon their land, who will make them shine, who will conquer the Gentile lands around them, who will make them rulers and kings, Friends, expectations of Jesus didn't change because that's exactly the Jesus that many churches proclaim today. Prosperity gospel and new apostolic reformation is all about that. 
that Jesus is the one who fulfill your dreams. He is going to defeat all your enemies. He is going to make you healthy and wealthy all the time. You will have prosperity, houses that you dream of, cars, wives, husbands, children. Everything will be fine if you believe in this type of Jesus. The only thing he doesn't have is salvation from sin. Very sad view, isn't it? Very carnal. It's all about this world and this life. Yet the Jesus who did indeed come to Jerusalem has come as a servant, not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus was looking towards the cross for far more important salvation work. He refused the temptation to become king, to be, co to be taken by the crowds and seize the power to fight the Romans. He had his eyes cast upon the cross. He knew his mission. He knew he, the will of God was, was for him to be betrayed, for, to be tried, to be tortured, to die upon the cross of Calvary, to become the sin bearer, to be nailed on that cross for our sins and to with his blood pay the penalty that we are due to God. Friends, is that our desire? Is this the Jesus that we truly need? I pray that the Holy Spirit, if he hasn't done it yet, will open your heart to see that you need the Jesus, the Savior from sin, far more than Jesus who sits on an earthly throne and conquers all, all the powers of this world. Sin is what will stand before God for on the judgment day. The Ten Commandments that God established on the Mount of Sinai will be our judging test. We have to answer to God for every evil we have spoken, done or thought about, for every good we haven't done. And there is no single human being who is not guilty before God. Christ has come to save sinners from their sins and to pay the penalty to God by taking our sins upon himself and thus paying the debt we owe to God. With his wounds, we are healed. Isaiah 53, 5 tells us, but he was pierced for our transgressions. By the way, that's written 700 years before Christ was born. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. That is away from God. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Jesus was coming as a Passover lamb in the temple of Jerusalem. All of the sins were transferred into this animal and that animal was to die and its blood was to be collected and sprinkled in the Holy of Holies, saying that the substitute has been offered and has been punished for the sins of the nation. In the same way, Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary, when he breathed his last and when he shouted, it is finished, accomplished the work of salvation and he shed blood paid the penalty for our sins, making us righteous and justified us before God. Have you believed in this, Jesus? Have you believed in the one? Have you repented of your sins? Have you repented of the sins? Have the Holy Spirit opened your eyes to them and to cry out to this Jesus for salvation? If not, I'm pleading before you for the sake of your soul, to cry to God that you may be forgiven, the new spirit given to you, and that you may enter the glories of heaven that only Jesus can do. Now, let's talk about the greater coronation, shall we? The greater entry, lastly. See, Jesus refused to take earthly power. Verse 11 tells us very clearly that, that people were puzzled even about the whole situation. They just says, oh, who is this? And he says, he's the prophet of Nazareth. All of a sudden, people started calling him the Savior. 
I don't know exactly what the reason is for that, but it does seem that the enthusiasm died very quickly. Jesus refused to take the earthly power because he became ruler in heaven for what he has done. When you open Revelation chapter 5, verse 8, let's read about the greater entrance of Jesus into the glory. It says, and when he had taken the scroll, that is the Lamb, Jesus Christ, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. Why does heaven proclaim that Jesus is worthy to open the scrolls for you are slain and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God and they shall reign on the earth then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. See, Jesus is a king unlike any other because he was not seeking his own glory, his own name, his own pride, his own wealth. Jesus was seeking the glory of God when he says, Father, not my will, but yours be done. He was seeking our own salvation out of love for us. That is why he's worthy to sit on the throne. His character proves that this is the spotless, righteous person who deserves to sit on the throne as his actions prove it. This is the king I worship. This is the king who alone is worthy to be worshipped. All others seek their own in one way or another. When you look through history, Caesars, Napoleons, when you look at the king, the greatest of the powers, they were seeking their own. They wanted to rule their little empires. Only Jesus Christ is the king who really died for his people, who was willing to take their curse upon himself and to bring everlasting peace between them and God. His grace and his love cannot be matched by anyone else. That's why he is my king. That's why... I rejoice in him and I pray that you will. Do you know that in heaven, the unnumbered multitude of people whom he has saved through his cross are a testimony of his, of his grace, great, great grace and love. None of us will ever deserve to be in heaven. None of the people in heaven deserves to be there. We'll be there only because of his grace, because he conquered us through the cross. Word indeed is the Lamb. He is crowned as King upon every believer's heart. He is crowned as King of heaven, the kingdom that will not pass away, the kingdom that will last forever. So friends, stop looking at the things of this world that will come to an end. Give yourself to the kingdom that will last forever. Give yourself to the work of the Savior. Crown him as your king and follow him as such. Obey him and he will give you the reward. Friends, Jesus Christ is the king unlike any other. He is the servant who came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Let the earth rejoice because this king will be coming back to save his people, to bring the kingdom of God and all of this world 
will eventually pass away. May to his name be the glory. May God bless you. Amen.